evening and welcome to another edition of JU Dolphins Up Close. I'm Scott Manzi. Last month we featured JU Volleyball's breast cancer awareness efforts and raising money and focus via the Dig Pink initiative and the players and coaches got to see from the other side what it means to help out a great campaign. In November, men across the country grow mustaches and beards as part of the Movember and No Shave November awareness campaign to support prostate cancer and other cancers that are so devastating to men. Around the athletic department, beards and mustaches have popped up over the last few weeks, including my own effort, as you can see. JU Athletics all about what's on the field and off the field. As we shift into a new group of sports seasons at JU, the theme of tonight's show is similar. We showcase the new men's basketball head coach and the still pretty new women's basketball head coach and their new teams as they get ready to hit the hardwood for the first time this year. We also showcase a new focus in the sports world, not just at JU, but nationally as relationship violence has become a bigger talking point seemingly by the day. The One Love Foundation visited campus last month and we see how a new focus on identifying problems before they happen is helping solve the problem. But first, an opportunity to meet one of the new coaches at JU, Marcy Robles, who is in a unique position as head coach of the men's rowing team. Here's how she puts the stereotypes behind her and hopes to help change the direction of women in coaching. Marcy Robles is different as a woman coaching men. She's in her first year leading the men's rowing program at JU, but being a female surrounded by males in this particular sport is not as unique as you might think. It's actually pretty common. Uh, for coxswains, there's a weight minimum, and it's a lot easier to find you know, girls that are closer to that, that weight minimum than it is to find guys. Uh, so there are a number of women on men's teams, which is unique in terms of collegiate sport, but not that unique as far as rowing right. goes. Robles was a coxswain herself at Boston College for four years and helped to lead her lightweight team to several top finishes while in command of the boat. The unique role of the coxswain helped put her in a coaching mindset at a young age. So the, the rowers in the boat are actually going backwards uh, and the coxswain's job is to steer. Um, so safety is, is their priority, but steering is a very close second. Um, you know, whether it's in the fall and they're racing 5K with turns or in the spring where they're racing 2K and it's, you know, a straight line from start to finish, um, they want to take the fastest line possible. So their main responsibility is steering. Uh, and they, they're information providers. They uh, give the rowers information as far as where they are in the race, um, what, where they are in the race plan, where other boats are. Um, how much distance they have left. Um, they're, they're really the eyes and ears of, of the crew and, and help the guys get a sense of where everything is so that the rowers can stay focused on what they're doing. Once her collegiate career ended, she surprised herself even by jumping right into coaching. At the end of my senior year, I got a call from the, the head coach of my brother's school. So I went to an all-girls school and, and the girls' school has a very successful team and the brother's school has also a very successful team. And so. Um, he is a friend of the family and he called me up and they needed a freshman coach for, for the girls team and so he kind of roped me in. I was a little resistant at first, I was sort of ready to be done with rowing, but uh, yeah, he, he called me up and I met with him and the head women's coach and I, I coached freshman girls my first year out of college. She wasn't ready to completely immerse herself into coaching, however, and attempted to transition away from rowing but in the end was drawn back to the sport she loved. So I, I coached in D.C. for a year and then I moved up to Boston to go to grad school. Um, and I actually went back to coxing for a club team and so sort of left coaching altogether. Um, finished grad school and I couldn't get a job in my field and so I moved home and this opportunity presented itself where I was able to volunteer at Georgetown. And about halfway through the year, something just clicked and I realized that I could get paid to do what I loved and, and that seemed like a more realistic goal than it had before. After coaching on the women's side for several years at both Georgetown and Gonzaga, Robles set her eyes on something new yet still familiar, men's rowing. I actually left Gonzaga with that goal in mind um, before this opportunity presented itself. And so I had been thinking for a while about how I wanted to switch over to the men's side because there just aren't a lot of women who do that. Um, and I knew that my experience co uh, coxing men in college, um, you know, I was hoping that that was going to be a strength and I was comfortable around male athletes. You know, I don't really treat them any differently than I treat my female athletes. Um, so I, I moved, I quit my job and I, and I moved home and I started looking for, for jobs in men's rowing and this worked out amazingly. I mean, it, it's an incredible opportunity and it, you know, it was great that, that Jim is someone that it, I know and have known for a couple of years and have worked with and so it just seemed like a, the perfect partnership. 
Director of Rowing Jim Mitchell was looking for someone to help lead the men's team at JU, and his familiarity with Robles made the decision easy for both sides. But that's not to say it didn't require a bit of an adjustment. I think it's been it's been an interesting transi transition for everybody um, in that there's you know a little bit of a different philosophy in terms of how to take the rowing stroke, and the training program is a little bit different than what they're used to. So um, everybody's learning together, myself included. The growth of rowing in the South has helped Robles transition from the country's more prominent rowing communities where she had coached previously. The first intercollegiate competition was a rowing race between Harvard and Yale. Um, and so it is definitely a very northeast oriented sport um, and you know, has eventually grown out of, out of Boston and, and Philly and New York. It's grown a lot in the West Coast as well. I mean, Cal and Washington have always had big teams. Um, actually, there's a book that just came out about the uh, 1936 Olympic crew that was from the University of Washington that won gold um, in, the, in the, the Olympics that were held in Germany. Um, it was a pretty, pretty tricky time, and so um, West Coast rowing was definitely uh, making a statement for sure. Um, rowing was actually really popular. Uh, there was a lot of betting in rowing, um, and, and you know they, they would fill rail cars with people and, and drive them along, along the race courses, and you know, people were cheering for teams like Washington and Cal and Harvard and Yale and Navy and Syracuse. I mean, it goes way back, and so the popularity popularity has definitely died down a bit. Um, but there, you know, recently there's definitely been a resurgence, especially at the high school level as well. Um, so it's it's big in the Northeast, it's big in the Mid Atlantic, it's it's big on the West Coast, and you know, it's getting bigger in Florida um, and in the Midwest and in the South, which is which is really cool to see. While Jacksonville is not a traditional rowing area, the weather and JU's location on the St. Johns River are some of its huge advantages when it comes to recruiting. You can pretty much row year round. I mean, this is the first November I've had in a long time where I've actually been excited about the weather. Um, you know, it's, it's mid seventies out and it's gorgeous and it's, you know, we're a week into November. I mean, I don't know anybody else in the country who's, who's able to boast about weather like that. Maybe California, but um, you know, I think for especially the, the kids who are in the colder climates, being able to row year round and not have to be indoors for you know months at a time, I think it's very attractive. You, you know, it's so convenient. You know, you spend so much time uh, during your college day, you know, transitioning from one activity to another. You know, the more you can cut down your commute, going to practice and, and then back to breakfast in the class, the, the easier. You know, I've had half hour drives just to get out to the boathouse, and that's that's an hour round trip. And so being able to stumble out of your dorm room and have the river and the boathouse right there is. is there are still some challenges as Robles adapts to her new role as head coach, especially in communication, both with her having never been a true rower and getting through to men. The unique part about being a coxswain who has turned into a coach is that I've never been a rower before. Um, so I, I don't have the, that perspective of someone who's going through the physical grind, and so I think that's hard to balance a little bit because it's a completely different experience. Uh, but in terms of um, communication and establishing relationships and really getting a good pulse on your crew and on your team, I think those are skills that have definitely um, developed because of my position as a coxswain. I think the communication is a little bit different, um, but it's like that on any team. You know, I, I, there were definitely on my teams of female athletes, um, not everybody communicates the same way, and it's the same thing with guys. You know, they, they don't all communicate the same way. And, so I think their interactions are, you know, a little bit different than, than maybe women's teams, but they all have the same expectations and the same goals in mind. So I don't know that I like one better, but yeah. I, I feel equally comfortable in both, for sure. Does she notice any difference in the way her male rovers respond to having a woman coaching them? I honestly think they don't care. I, I, they just they want to go fast and they want to win. And, you know, I think as long as they have guidance and support, that's really all that matters. I mean. You know, I don't, again, I don't treat them any differently than I do with my female athletes. And so um, it's not a big deal to them, which is great. It shouldn't be. Robles is currently one of three female head coaches of men's rowing teams in the country. But to her, she sees it as a part of a process to becoming less of a big deal for women to coach men across all sports. I don't know that I'm a trendsetter. Um, you know, there, there are definitely women before me who have been more trailblazers than, mm -hmm. than I and so have sort of set that. Um, as a goal, at least for women who are interested in getting into, into men's rowing. I think, um, I just, I think I just want to open up a career for women and sort of see myself as part of a, a transition, not as anything special, just sort of a, a way to get women to a place where they're not being questioned about their gender.
because they're coaching men's teams. They're just another coach. Um, you know, there aren't a lot of men, at least that I know, that get asked why they coach women. Um, and it would be great if we could get to that same point with women coaching men. So I, I just hope to sort of be a link to, to that place. I think even in this year alone, there have been a number of women, uh, not just in collegiate sports, but um, I think in Europe as well. I think there's a soccer league where they've had um, a woman be the program manager. Um, it's definitely becoming more of a trend, and I think the more comfortable you know, women are applying to men's jobs and, and men having women as, as their coaches, the, the less of a deal it's going to be. Finn Fever is the annual pep rally before basketball season that gets everyone fired up for the new year. This time around, it doubled as a meet and greet as the men's and women's teams introduced five new coaches, 20 new players, and an entirely new energy surrounding the programs. was a good night. I think uh, it's always fun for our guys to be able to come out and spend some time with students, spend some time with fans, and then get to have some fun on the court, you know, three-point contests, some dunk contests, and things like that. I think these events are always great to, uh, to really kick off the year and, uh, and, and have a little bit of fun, uh, have a little bit of fun on campus. I thought our people, I thought Diana did a great job of, of orchestrating it, getting everybody uh, excited on campus, and it's definitely something that our, our team looks forward to every year. I know, I just woke up um, this morning, I could not believe we're a week away from getting ready to start our season. My best time of the year, November, not for Thanksgiving, but because it's the start of the season. We're excited, we're pumped up, we're ready to go. November 14th versus Florida at their place. First home opener, November 20th. The guys open up on the 16th. We're ready, everyone's excited. We're just gonna have fun. This was about bringing awareness to everybody to let them know that we're getting ready to kick off our season. We're just asking for the support. We're, we're both programs are gonna be committed to putting out their heart and soul. And I know women's basketball is no limit, no ceilings on us. We're, we're just trying to create our culture. Um, at the end of the day, we've got what, what will be probably the most inexperienced team in the country uh, playing against a schedule that we were dealt that, that's extremely competitive. And, uh, and my goal is that we just continue to get better, continue to grow and, and build uh, as a team throughout the year. And if we can do that, uh, success will come our way at some point. Yardley Love was killed four years ago now as a result of relationship violence. Her mother, Sharon, still travels around the country telling her story in hopes that it might prevent just one less statistic. The women's lacrosse team at JU is instrumental in bringing Sharon to campus and are now also playing part in the new technological advances in preventing relationship violence. The One Love Foundation was started after the death of Virginia women's lacrosse player Yardley and Love in 2010 as a result of relationship violence. Yardley's mother Sharon tours the country to speak to groups about the warning signs of relationship violence and she addressed a standing room only Gooding Auditorium at JU in October much to the surprise of many of those involved. Yeah, I was definitely surprised. Um, I thought we did a pretty good job of spreading awareness by handing out the t-shirts because everyone who came up to me was like, hey, where do I get this t-shirt? And they seemed pretty interested. So I kind of expected a good turnout, but I was very pleased to see. Well, I was definitely surprised. There were kids sitting on the stairs um, where I was sitting. So there were definitely more students there than seats. Um, I think it really helped when Greek life got involved and the sororities and the fraternities, which is a whole 
another set of students besides athletes that started to get involved with this really helped boost up the numbers. Women's lacrosse players Tori Seitz and Kelsey Wigglesworth served as facilitators for the focus groups and also headed up the Share the Love Week in preparation for Sharon's talk. Every day during lunch, we would hand out t-shirts and headbands if students downloaded the One Love app, which is the educational app for domestic violence. The app is one of the many new ways the foundation is continuing to try and reach the college age demographic, its main target. It gives you a lot of information about domestic violence and then you can also take self-assessments or assessments for your friends. So even if students weren't you know, comfortable saying they were involved in domestic violence or if they weren't, they could still download the app and take it for one of their friends. And so I think a lot of students like that and they got a free t-shirt that says uh, Jacksonville University on the front and One Love Foundation on the back. There was also a film that many students, especially student athletes, watched and were able to provide feedback on before they attended the talk. Yeah, it definitely was an attention grabber and it made people kind of more interested in the topic. Um, the video was pretty easy to relate to and understand and follow. And it really helped at the end when we could give our opinion about what we thought about the video so they could make it better and uh, give our advice for improvements. So it really made us feel like we were a part of helping the spread the love and share the love. For many, it was the first exposure they had gotten to the story. I had no idea. I had never heard of the story or um, I had never even seen anything that had to do with relationship violence, period. So I had no idea that it was such a serious issue. And I had no idea what we were even going to watch, in all honesty. I just, they told us we were going to go to a One Love event, and we were all like, what's One Love? This was a key reason why Sites and Wigglesworth became so involved in promoting the Share the Love message. I mean, personally, I've not ever been involved in a domestic violence situation, but I think it's something that needs to be talked about. I think alcohol is touched on a lot, um, and I think alcohol is a big factor in domestic violence, and nobody talks about it. And then... I also had known the story for when it happened in 2010 because Yarley is from Baltimore and I'm from Baltimore. Um, we play on the same club lacrosse team and it was also just like a lacrosse community thing. Like she was a women's lacrosse player, I'm a women's lacrosse player. Uh, so I just felt a tie to it in that way. Um, well, it first really grabbed my attention because Yardley was so similar to me. She was athletic and she went to school and she had a boyfriend. So it immediately grabbed my attention and the fact that I'm from Baltimore and she's from Baltimore. Um, but I really think that relationship violence kind of goes under the weather. Not many people pay attention to it or really even know about it. So I think it's really important to spread the awareness and make people more aware about it so they can stop it in the future. And I really enjoy taking a part of that. For those like baseball player Cameron Gibson who weren't previously familiar, the video and talk served as an eye opener. You watch the movie and the guy's kind of, he's really intense and things like that, but she, it never gets to the point where you think she's actually, he's actually going to kill her kind of thing. And then that happens and he kills her. And then immediately after that, they show uh, like the pictures of all the girls that have been victims of this, this crime. And it just kind of, that was really the point where it, it kind of hit home. Like, this is real. This is like a problem that people deal with. Um, and it's, it's like a serious issue that we need to be aware of. With relationship violence stories featuring prominent athletes such as Ray Rice and Greg Hardy dominating the news cycle right now, it seems as a good as time as any to promote the foundation's message. Uh, yeah, I'd say any time is a good time to start because not many people know about it. So it's the fact that getting it out there and then um, I guess it's easy to relate to because we see it so many, so many times in the news with famous people, but it ha the true thing is that it, it happens every day with normal people too. It's not just famous people. And that's what we're really trying to, um, to spread. Yeah, definitely. I definitely think this is probably one of the best times that you possibly can, seeing as it's, it's the face of the media right now. Um, like you said, big collegiate athletes, um, professional athletes being uh, accused and involved in these domestic violence cases. Um, now is as, a, as good a time as ever to make a push for more awareness for these kinds of these kinds of actions and these crimes. The reception after the Share the Love Week has been quite positive. The feedback I got from the talk was very positive. They were interested to hear Share and Love speak and the movie part, Escalation, which is what we tested on the students before, was a fictional case of domestic violence. Like it was a made up story and then this was, you know, real life. You know, you could put a face to the family um, and I think students liked that difference that it wasn't just you know 
they saw, sometimes they saw the movie as unrealistic, but then when, you know, Sharon Love was speaking, they, they were facts. And I think students could really relate to that. I really liked how uh, during the Sharon Love speech that so many people afterwards stayed after to ask her specific questions. And I know that they weren't a part of athletics or, or Greek life. So um, it was really the other people take interest and willing to uh, share the love. Athletes at JU who are constantly performing on a stage in front of their peers have a unique platform. Definitely, when you play um, on a big stage at a Division One level, you're going to have you know the opportunity to voice and be a part, be a platform for anything that you want to stand for. And just being a part of a team, one, you're going to have that competitive nature. You're going to have that brotherhood. So I think it's yeah, it's really important for especially teams, faces of teams, especially at bigger universities, to become part of these kinds of endeavors because uh, you're you're the voice that people are going to listen to, especially on campus. If, especially if you're the big star, um, you're the person that people are going to be looking to. And if you take a stance against something, then other people are going to follow. The movie and talk have already raised Gibson's awareness to relationship violence. Looking back on it uh, now, I probably have like I never. People get into fights and things like that all the time, but like you don't really ever think like, oh, it's going to escalate that far. You, you you never think that somebody that you would associate yourself with would be capable of doing anything like that. But when you when you start becoming aware of the signs and you you see like the actual victims itself, it's kind of alerted me to it. And now I feel like maybe there might have been a few cases. I don't know if it was actually the case, but I mean, looking back, if I could go back, I definitely might have investigated further. Thank you for tuning in to another edition of JU Dolphins Up Close. Until next time, I'm Scott Manzi, voice of the Dolphins, bidding you good night.